Hi, everyone. Welcome to Explore Classroom with Nizar Ibrahim. I'm Lindsay Anderson here at National Geographic, and I'm broadcasting today from Nat Geo headquarters in Washington, D.C., while our host, Joe Grabowski, and our explorer, Nizar, are both in Canada. And we have viewers from all over the world. So I want to remind everyone that you can tweet using the hashtag Let's Explore. And let us know where you're watching from. And you can also ask questions, and we'll keep an eye and, and feed them back into the conversation. Before we get started, I just want to remind our educators watching to check out natgeoed.org. You can find uh, resources and activities for your classrooms and even more info on Nizar. So I want to thank Joe and Nizar for being here with us today, and I think we're, we're ready to roll. Joe, take it away. All right, Lindsay, thanks so much for the intro. As Lindsay said, my name's Joe. I'm a teacher in Guelph, Ontario, uh, math and science, so it's always a thrill to be hosting these hangouts. Um, our speaker today, uh, Nizar, he's a pro at hangouts. He's done two or three. He's got them under his belt. He's uh, a paleontologist, so his playground, his workspace is in the Saharan Desert. Uh, he's made some incredible finds uh, there so far, including a wonderful skeleton of Spinosaurus, a predatory dinosaur larger than the T-Rex, um, a giant pterosaur, and, uh, and it's a new species with a wingspan of up to 18 uh, feet that lived 95 million years ago. So the Saharan Desert, Nizar is gonna talk all about it, was a completely different place than it is now. Uh, almost a wonderland of big predators. So, uh, Nisar, uh, without further ado, it's great to have you joining us once more. All right, thank you, Joe. So, I guess I'll just start the screen share. So, I'll give you a very uh, quick run through the world of paleontology and dinosaurs um, and show you some of the places we work in and some of the creatures we have uncovered over the last few years. So, Entire screen though. Okay, is this working? So far, so good. All right. So, right. So, I decided that I wanted to be a paleontologist at a very early age, and you know, I think a lot of kids are interested in in dinosaurs and and other prehistoric animals. Um, some people say that they wanted to become paleontologists because um, it's a science that involves a lot of detective work. You're piecing together skeletons um, of long extinct creatures. Um, but of course, you can, you can be a detective in many different areas of science, or you can just be a detective. So for me, that was not the main uh, draw. The reason why I wanted to be a paleontologist was because I loved animals and I love the idea of traveling back in time. I wanted to be a time traveler. So if you look at this image here, you can see humans at the very end there. But of course, the history of our planet goes back billions of years. And so there are lots and lots of um, strange, bizarre, extinct ecosystems hidden in the rocks. And so if you're a paleontologist, you get to be a time traveler and you can visit these alien worlds. And that's really what got me um, interested in paleontology. So you have an opportunity to um, visit strange places like this one here. This is an ancient Mesozoic Sea from the, the age of dinosaurs. And you can see that these places are full of animals that don't exist anymore. I have a long-necked plesiosaur here. Um, and these ecosystems also functioned in a very different way. We have giant predators. These guys here are um, quite a bit longer than a great white shark. We have giant marine predators, dinosaurs on land, flying reptiles. So some of these animals have no modern day equivalent. Here's another plesiosaur hunting for fish. So if we go far enough, we can find some interesting ancestors of modern groups. We can find ancestors of, of, of mammals, of amphibians, of birds. So paleontology also helps us reconstruct the history of life on our planet. And we can see how evolution has tried out all kinds of strange things. This here is an extinct amphibian, a temnospondyl, and you can see it has lots and lots of teeth. So you see strange um, features that you don't see in modern animals anymore. You can see that um, a lot of different body shapes and 
skull forms have been tried out over the course of evolution. So that's the other big thing that we do. We piece together a grand epic story, the history of life on our planet. Whoops, there we go. Um, of course, some, oh, lost my screen, there we go. Of course, some extinct animals are very famous. Uh, I think some of you might know what this one is called. Any ideas? Yes, sir. Uh, said the Velociraptor? It is a Velociraptor, that's right. <laughs> that's a very famous dinosaur. Um, it has sickle claws. It was, of course, uh, famously portrayed in Jurassic Park. Um, and it's a feathered dinosaur, which is very interesting. Do you know why this dinosaur is feathered? Ideas why it has feathers? Um, yes, sir. Um, maybe for camouflage. Say it again. Maybe for camouflage. Um, he said possibly for camouflage purposes. That's right. It may have been used for camouflage. Maybe it was used to make the animal look bigger, a little bit like the, the feathers in a, in a peacock. But um, the really interesting thing about the feathers in predatory dinosaurs is that feathers, if you think of feathers, what is the first group of animals you think about? Birds, right? Bird. A uh, feather is a quintessential bird feature. But we now know that many dinosaurs were feathered. And so this tells us that birds evolve from predatory dinosaurs. So birds are dinosaurs. That's one of the great evolutionary stories we can understand because we have these dinosaur fossils. So this is a very famous dinosaur, Velociraptor. Here's another very famous one, also feathered in this reconstruction. Do you know what this one is called? T-Rex. This is T-Rex. And you know where T-Rex was found, right? What continent? Do you know what continent? Where do you say, guys? Where? Somebody said Asia. Asia? Well, there's a very close relative of T-Rex in Asia. But T-Rex itself is found in North America. It's a North American dinosaur. So most of the famous dinosaurs you know, T-Rex, Diplodocus, um, Stegosaurus, Triceratops, those are all North American dinosaurs. Um, so we know a lot about North America's dinosaurs. We now know quite a bit about dinosaurs from Asia. Uh, we're finding more and more fossils in South America. But one part of the world is really underrepresented. And it's Africa. Africa is really a big unknown. We only have a few dinosaurs from Africa. And you have to keep in mind that Africa is a huge landmass, but we know very little about the age of dinosaurs in Africa. And that's really um, what I'm interested in. I'm interested in finding out more about um, Africa's dinosaurs, because we know so much about T-Rex, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, and so on, but we know very little about Africa's dinosaurs. Oh, this image here is actually not supposed to be here. I can just show you this anyway. This is me working with a living animal. You know what this is? This is an alligator. Um, so I'm not just out there digging for fossils. I'm also working with living animals. Um, any idea why I'm doing that? Why do I work with living animals? So what do you think? I turned on uh, the group with Chris in New York. Why do you guys think he's working with living animals? You got to say it loud. You gotta say it. So they can know the difference? Yeah, so we can look at differences. But most importantly, if we want to understand, say, how the jaws of a dinosaur work, or the legs, or the tail, um, and we want to reconstruct the muscles of a dinosaur, um, then we have to look at living animals. And so close relatives of dinosaurs include birds and crocs. So we spend quite a lot of time looking at living animals. And of course, if you look at other extinct animals, like a, a mammoth, for example, you look at an elephant. So that's what we call comparative anatomy, and it's a very important part of paleontology. Right. So back to our um, geographical focus, Africa. So as I said, I'm interested in Africa's dinosaurs because they're so poorly understood, and we, we know very little about the age of dinosaurs in Africa. So I decided to explore uh, a huge chunk of Africa. Um, 
in the north, and it's a massive desert. You know what it's called? The what, sir? Sahara Desert? The Sahara, that's right, the Sahara. And this is a picture from the Sahara. You can see these giant sand dunes. It's a very remote part of the world, so it's quite difficult to work there, and very few people have searched for dinosaur fossils in the Sahara. Some people um, explored the Sahara a very, very long time ago. This is one of them. This is a, a German paleontologist called Ernst Stromer, and he was really one of the first to um, thoroughly explore the Sahara. Um, of course, at the time, it was even more challenging. They were not using uh, four-wheel drive cars. Um, you can see him here with uh, one of his camels. Um, it was very, very difficult to find fossils and get them out of the desert. But those are the early pioneers. So because of these people, we know that some incredible dinosaur fossils can be found in the Sahara. So I was kind of trying to follow in the footsteps of these early explorers. This is the Sahara today. This is a, uh, an image where you don't see sand dunes. Those are actually rocky outcrops, and that's what we're looking for. We're not finding dinosaur fossils in loose sand. We find them in rock. And these rocks that you see there exposed, they're about um, 100 million years old. This is a, another picture from the desert, a beautiful sunset. So it really is a magical place. Being out there in the desert, yes, you're in a very remote place but it is also an incredibly beautiful place. It's a timeless place. Um, no big buildings, uh, no cell phones, no internet, um, but incredible sunsets and uh, incredible views. It can also be a deadly place, of course. Um, as you know, the Sahara is a very harsh environment. It can get very hot, so every now and then you'll come across skeletons, not of dinosaurs, but this here is a camel. So um, that's always a little reminder that the Sahara is also an unforgiving place. It is a very beautiful place, but it can also be deadly. And of course, there are quite a few um, uh, potentially dangerous animals roaming the Sahara, including a, a large number of venomous snakes. So you kind of have to be um, a little careful, and you have to make sure you always um, have enough water. You have to make sure that you don't get lost when you're searching for fossils. Um, because, as I said, there's no internet, no Google Maps. And this is what it looks like when you're actually standing on these rocky outcrops. Um, as you can probably tell from this picture, it takes a long time to get up there um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, where you can look for the fossils. It's a pretty difficult climb. You can see there's a lot of boulders and rocks coming down the slopes. So it's not very stable. So there's a lot of difficult climbing involved. So you're not just walking around the desert picking up things on the floor, you have to climb up these pretty steep slopes to find the fossils. We go out there with four-wheel drive cars. This is one of our cars. Um, we have to bring a lot of supplies. Uh, and you can probably guess what the most important supply is. What do you absolutely need when you go to the desert? What do you need? Water water, that's right. Um, sometimes we find remote villages like this one, and we can buy supplies there. We can get water and, and other things we need. Um, but uh, once you really go far out in the desert, there are no more villages. It's just uh, uh, rocks and sand. These are our cars from one of our um, 2015 expeditions. Um, and you see fewer and fewer cars the further away you go. Here's a, a camel crossing. And at some point, you're out there in the middle of nowhere. You can see one of our cars for scale here. So there are no more roads, no other cars, um, and no electricity lines, nothing. Um, and you can see it looks like a sea of sand. It really looks uh, uh, bizarre. It looks a little bit like Mars. You've probably seen pictures of Mars with these, you know, red outcrops, and the Sahara sometimes looks very similar. So when you're out there and you want to find fossils, um, you know, it's, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. <laughs> this is a very big place. So what we do is we look at geological maps of the Sahara, so we know where rocks of the right age are exposed, and then we go to those places. Um, this is one of them. And then we start walking around 
You can see our cars here in the corner and a person walking around. And then we walk around for hours and hours looking for fossils sticking out of the ground. Um, again, these are two of our cars on an earlier expedition. And you can see I'm using binoculars to find outcrops in the distance. So we're looking at areas that look promising, where the rocks kind of look um, um, interesting to a geologist's eye or a paleontologist's eye. And so those are the places we try to visit. So we have to cover a lot of ground. And then, if you're lucky, you will find things. Um, right there, you can see this is a dinosaur leg bone right in front of me. It's kind of broken into smaller chunks because it was exposed to the elements. It was exposed to the wind and the sun. Uh, and so the bones start to fall apart. So you really want to look for fossils that are kind of buried in the ground. And they're just sticking out a little bit. And we don't just find bones. We also find other things. Um, if you tilt your head, you can probably see what this is. There are three toes preserved here. This is a dinosaur track. It looks a little bit like a bird track. It's, um, it's a three-toed predatory dinosaur footprint. So we find bones. We find footprints. We also find teeth. This is a tooth um, that I'm holding in my hand there, um, showing it to my British colleague, Dave Matil. So most of the time, we find isolated bits and pieces not complete skeletons. Um, but those isolated bits and pieces can be very large. This here is a partial upper arm bone of a giant plant-eating dinosaur. And it's absolutely massive. Um, it belonged to one of the largest dinosaurs known. And it's the largest um, dinosaur bone ever found in this part of the Sahara. So that was a big thrill. I found this um, bone back in 2008. So that was one of my very first expeditions. So I was very excited when we found this. Um, over the years, we have collected thousands of fossils. And you can see them there in these plastic bags. We put all the fossils in little bags so they're protected. Um, and we put labels on them so we know where every fossil was found. You can see a, a tent in the background. So this is one of our camps, one of our desert camps. And we use all those fossils to reconstruct the ecosystem that existed here 100 million years ago. And uh, it's a really interesting place. It's very different from the Sahara today. Um, we know that 100 million years ago, this place was full of crocodile-like predators. This is one of them, Elosuchus. It's a giant croc. Um, it could grow to the length of a, almost to the length of a school bus. <coughs> um, and it's just one of seven or eight different crocodile-like predators in this environment. So clearly, 100 million years ago, this was not a dry desert. This was, in fact, a river system full of crocs and big fish. You can see a giant sawfish here. And of course, a giant predatory dinosaur. And this particular predatory dinosaur is Spinosaurus. It's the longest predatory dinosaur known. And we are lucky enough to describe a partial skeleton of Spinosaurus. And it is a really bizarre dinosaur. It's very, very different from other predatory dinosaurs, like T-Rex. It has a giant sail on its back, has paddle-like feet, and a long snout for catching fish. This is what the reconstructed skeleton of Spinosaurus looks like. Um, there's a National Geographic documentary you can uh, watch where you can see how we put the skeleton together. But you can see it's an absolutely massive predator with a crocodile-like skull. It's a fish-catching dinosaur. So this dinosaur also spent a lot of time in the water. It had paddle-like feet um, and had bones that look more like those of water-loving animals than land-loving animals. And it has this giant sail, which is similar to sails we see in other animals. This one here is called Dimitrodon. It's another extinct animal. Here's another sail in a lizard. And here's a sail in a crested chameleon. So again, we're looking at living animals like the crested chameleon to reconstruct the bizarre sail of Spinosaurus. And we think that the sail was used to make the animal look bigger. It's something Spinosaurus used to um, maybe attract a mate or um, intimidate other Spinosaurus. Uh, because if you're in the water, that's the one part of your body that is sticking out, this giant sail. It's visible from far away. So this is what Spinosaurus would have looked like swimming 
through this Saharan river system 100 million years ago. There's spinosaurus coming out on land and just caught a giant fish. You can see some of the crocs there and a few other predatory dinosaurs. This place was uh, home to not just lots of crocs and spinosaurus, but also several other giant predatory dinosaurs. And this here's one of them, Carodontosaurus, hunting a large plant-eating dinosaur. So that's quite unusual, finding lots and lots of giant predators in the same environment. That's something we really only see in this part of Africa and nowhere else in the world. There's another giant predator we found. Um, do you know what kind of an animal this is? Any ideas? Say it again. I think I heard it from the New York group. Go again, Chris's group. <laughs> it's a pterosaur. So it's a flying reptile. It's not a bird. It's not a bat. It's a flying reptile. And we found remains of this giant a uh, pterosaur called Alanca Sahara. Okay, it was a new species. Um, and we found remains of several other flying reptiles. You can see some of them in the background. And it turns out that some of them grew to an absolutely enormous size. Um, I can't tell you much more about this now because this is something we are working on right now. But um, stay tuned. At some point this year, you will hear about um, our new pterosaur discoveries. And they're really pretty spectacular. So. Even the skies in this ecosystem were filled with predators. Here you can see some of the um, heads of the pterosaurs uh, from the Sahara. Um, they look rather different, so they're feeding on, on different things, um, maybe avoiding competition. They were not all feeding on the same kind of prey. So this is what our Saharan ecosystem was like then, a predator's paradise. Giant flying reptiles, predatory dinosaurs, crocs, so clearly this place was very, very different from the world T-Rex lived in, for example. T-Rex was the only giant predator in its ecosystem. Um, and it was living amongst lots and lots of large uh, plant-eating dinosaurs like Triceratops. Um, so the Sahara really was different. And so that tells us that Africa can tell us some very important things about dinosaur age ecosystems. We think we know what dinosaur ecosystems were like, but we really only know what dinosaur ecosystems were like in, in North America and Asia, but it turns out that Africa was rather different. So um, that's why I um, decided to go to Africa, and as it turns out, it was the right decision because we're finding um, some of the strangest dinosaur age ecosystems known there. Um, one last thing I want to tell you before we go to questions is um, in my work, I, I, I work with people from many different kinds of backgrounds. So if you're interested in becoming a paleontologist, um, that's great. But there are lots of other um, opportunities to get involved in this kind of work. Um, I work with geologists. I work with anatomists. And I also work with artists. So this guy here is Davide Bonadonna. He created all the artwork you saw in today's presentation. Um, so people from uh, an art background with an art background can also get involved in paleontology. That's what he does for a living. He draws dinosaurs and reconstructs their muscles. Um, he draws illustrations for dinosaur books. So lots of opportunities to get involved in paleontology. And of course, you can also volunteer uh, in a museum or join a, a local dig somewhere. So lots of opportunities out there to get involved. And that's the end of this part. We'll go to questions. Just wanted to tell you why I'm drawn to the Sahara. And I think yeah, now you, you know why. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to some of the strange creatures we have uncovered there. So I'm ready for your questions now. All right. Nassara, thank you so much. I always love watching your presentations. and. I really love the fact that you have the illustrations to go along with them because it really brings the world to life. You don't always see that when you look at the bones, so that's amazing. Right. Also, I, I guess with the, uh, you know, I mean, you're very interested in sharks and, and marine ecosystems. When you tell people uh, about a great white shark, you don't necessarily need to show them a picture. They know what it looks like. When you tell them about the pterosaur, it's 
always helps to have an image because these animals are so bizarre. And as I said, they really don't have any modern day ecosystem, uh, uh, modern day equivalent. So yeah. All right. Well, we're going to take a minute and visit our classroom. So we'll start off with two questions each, and then we'll swing back if there's time for another round as well. Any of the viewers online, if you are watching on YouTube, there's a little chat sidebar on the right. You're more than welcome to tell us where you're from and, and put your question in. We'll make sure we get to a couple of those as well. So my classroom, I've got some grade sevens with me and we're in Guelph, Ontario. So I think about 20 minutes from you, Nassar, in Kitchener. <laughs> um, and this is Riley, he's got a question for you. Yeah, come on up. Uh, what made you want to study dinosaurs? What made me want to study dinosaurs? Um, I mean, I, I'm really interested in, in many different kinds of animals. I just love animals. But I guess dinosaurs were particularly interesting because they're so bizarre. I mean, I sometimes describe them like, you know, like aliens from outer space. You know, if you look at some of these large plant-eating dinosaurs, um, they're much, much taller than a giraffe. Some of them weigh um, over 50 or 60 tons. So that's like the weight of an entire herd of elephants. Or you look at something like Spinosaurus. They're just really bizarre animals. And I think, you know, of course, a mammoth is, is an interesting animal, but it kind of looks like a hairy elephant, right? So dinosaurs, on the other hand, are so alien. And I think that's really what got me interested in dinosaurs at first. All right. Well, let's visit one of our classrooms. We have Mrs. Zamora's group giving you some great answers during the presentation. They're joining us from Texas today. Let me turn your microphone on, and you guys can have a couple questions. I have one. Hold on. Kelsey, make sure you can see yourself. Go ahead and introduce yourself, babe, and ask a question. Hi, I'm Kelsey, and um, I was wondering, how do you know how old the dinosaur bones are when you find them? Very good question. <laughs> So how do we know how old the dinosaur bones are when we find them? Um, there are different dating methods. Sometimes we date um, geological layers that are right underneath or on top of the dinosaur bone-bearing layers. So if you have volcanic deposits, for example, that's great. Those can be dated. So if those are on top of the dinosaur bones, whatever is underneath is older. As you go further back in time and you go through the layers, you know. You, gets older and older. Um, sometimes you can use um, certain types of fossils for dates. Certain types of ammonites, for example, uh, can be used to date uh, deposits. So if you have ammonites somewhere in your rock sequence, you can use those. Um, you can also, there are also different dating methods you can use on the bones themselves. Um, so there, there's a wide range of different tools. And ideally, we use um, you know, different methods, and if they all tell us the same age, then, you know, we're very confident that, you know, we know exactly how all those fossils are. The bones that we find in the Sahara are a little difficult to date, so they're about 100 million years old, but it's really difficult to, um, to get a precise age for those fossils. Um, they're no, they don't have any, there are no volcanic layers there. Um, so it's, it's a little tricky, but they're about 100 million years old. All right, great question. Go ahead with another one. Derek, go ahead. Uh, my name is Darren. What was the, the, the first bone you discovered? Found? What, was, what was the first dinosaur bones that you discovered? OK, that's a very good question. Uh, first dinosaur bones. Um, it was the first fossil I found in the Sahara was a, a, a tooth of a sawfish. Um, but I guess the first dinosaur bones I found, it was probably, you know, sometimes you find dinosaur bone and it's just a chunk of bone. You can't really tell what dinosaur it was. But I think the first piece I could identify, I think, was a piece of a Spinosaurus vertebra, I think. Um, not 100% sure, but I think it was a chunk from the front of a Spinosaurus vertebra. All right, well, we'll swing back uh, to the class in a little bit, but let's, we've got two classes from New York joining us. Um, and we'll go to the class with Colin first. So I'm gonna turn your mic on, Colin, can you hear me? 
Can you guys hear me? All right. Let me know what grade you are, and then go ahead with the question. Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. it's a little garbled, but I can hear you. Angelina, I'm in fourth grade. I hit the earth to make him go extinct. I only heard part of this. I don't know, did you hear this, Joe? Yeah, I heard she said extinction. Grade, but then I lost the rest. Um, um, I think that the I think that the dinosaurs got extinct because the asteroid hit the Earth and wiped them out. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Okay, uh, great question. So we know that. Um, Yes, there was a big impact. An asteroid hit our planet um, at the end of the Cretaceous. So we know that that happened, but there was probably not enough to kill off uh, most of the dinosaurs. I want to say most of the dinosaurs, I'm saying that because a small group of dinosaurs, birds, did survive. Um, but the asteroid hit the worst possible place on our planet. Um, uh, it was a combination of different factors, probably. It was an asteroid, there was a lot of um, volcanic activity, um, there were climatic and sea level changes. Um, it was really a mix of different things, and it was this combination of different factors that drove T Rex and Triceratops and so on to extinction. Um, so, in a sense, dinosaurs got very unlucky. They had been the rulers of this planet for a very, very long time. And I guess at some point, it was almost like the forces of nature conspired <laughs> against the dinosaurs. Um, but what's really interesting to me about the dinosaur extinction is, you know, if this asteroid had missed, I don't think the other factors would have been enough to drive uh, all dinosaurs to extinction. And that, of course, would mean that dinosaurs would have been around for quite a bit longer, and they would have changed the entire course of uh, evolutionary history, and we wouldn't be around talking about dinosaurs today. We probably wouldn't be around at all. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a very good point. At the time, mammals were just tiny little creatures, right? Just barely kind of holding on, so that asteroid definitely opened up a lot of, uh, a lot of habitats and niches for mammals. That's right. All right, let's see if we can get one more. I saw Colin's group dropped out, but if you guys are back in, do you have one more question? Yes, we're back. Um, Stand up so they can see. Stand up. There you go. My name is Angela. I'm a I have a question for you. Is it fun doing your job? <laughs> Is it fun doing my job? You bet. <laughs> um, I like it because you get to do um, different things. So it never really gets boring. So I'll, I'll just give you a few examples. So um, you're an anatomist. So you're working on the anatomy of animals. But you're also a, a geologist. You're trying to understand. Um, you know, you're trying to reconstruct ancient ecosystems, looking at the rocks where these ecosystems are preserved. Um, you work uh, like a detective, piecing together skeletons of long extinct animals. You get to travel. Um, you get to uh, talk to people uh, like yourself. You get to, to talk to um, uh, kids all around the, the country. That's what I'm doing when I'm doing presentations. Um, so they're really different aspects of my work that I really, really enjoy. And uh, I think there are not many jobs that allow you to do, you know, that many different things um, as part of the same job. All right, so just checking online, I see we have a group from Virginia Beach watching online. Looks like uh, Mrs. Byers' group. And so they've got a few questions. We'll start with one. So they're wondering, what's the largest species of dinosaur? Mm, very good question. Um, and there are a few contenders. Um, 
they're all big sauropod dinosaurs, so very large plant-eating dinosaurs with long necks and long tails. Um, the problem is that many of those uh, finds of very large plant-eating dinosaurs are very incomplete. So one of them uh, is called Argentinosaurus, but we only have a few bones, so we really don't know what the entire skeleton looked like. Sometimes we just find a giant leg bone. They recently found a, a giant thigh bone in France. Um, absolutely massive, uh, but that's it. You know, they don't really have a, a, a good partial skeleton. So from the more complete ones, we know that some of these dinosaurs would have been um, well over 30 meters in length and quite likely uh, much, much longer than that. Um, estimating the weight is quite difficult, but again, 60 tons, 65 tons, maybe more. Um, so absolutely massive animals. So I think the really interesting thing is not so much which one was the biggest, because we might never be able to tell. What's really interesting is to try and find out what the limits are to size when you're a terrestrial animal. We know that a blue whale is the largest animal in the sea, but um, when you're on land, you have to deal with many other issues. It's much easier to be big in the water because you're, you know, the water is supporting your weight, but when you're walking around on land, uh, it's very difficult. You know? so, trying to understand how these dinosaurs push the limits of what's possible. That's what's really interesting. All right. It's amazing, too, they got so big on a diet of, of plants. You don't usually yeah, with, and with very small heads. Yeah. It's not like they have massive heads with giant jaws, you know, so it took them a long time to, you know, uh, collect all the food they needed. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, it kind of does make sense because they're just – so they would spend a lot of time just standing there, and they have these long necks. They're just moving the necks around. They don't even need to move the body. And, you know, so they just, like, eat um, over a wide radius and not really spend much energy moving around. Um, and they have a very interesting digestive system as well. They're kind of fermenting all this food in a giant fermentation cham chamber. That's why they have these big uh, bodies. Um, so it's, it's a pretty unique model, but it clearly worked really well. All right, and so our second group in uh, New York, they're with Chris, and I'm gonna turn the mic on. You guys can go ahead with a couple questions. Let us know your name and a question. Hi, my name is Caesar. Uh, my question is, how many years does it take to find the whole body of a dinosaur? Hmm, good question. How many years does it take to find uh, a more or less complete skeleton of a dinosaur? Um, it depends. Uh, if it's a small dinosaur, <laughs> you can collect it pretty quickly and you bring it to the lab. But then, of course, you have to prepare it. And, you know, sometimes the rock, it's preserved and it's very hard. Sometimes it's not, you know. So sometimes that process of preparing the fossil can, can take years. But sometimes it's very quick. Um, if you're collecting a large dinosaur skeleton, that can take a long time. But again, it depends how many people do you have um, helping you at the dig site. Um, you know, do you have uh, some logistical help? Sometimes in the U.S. people even use things like helicopters to get dinosaur bones out of the field and back to the lab. So it really depends. There's no um, number I can give you. Uh, it, it really depends on the type of skeleton uh, you're finding and, and your um, logistical support. All right, great question. Go ahead with another one. Hi, my name is Pedro. Um, have you ever digged up a titanosaur? Oh, good question. So uh, have we ever found a titanosaur? Titanosaurs are very large plant-eating dinosaurs. And um, the big giant dinosaur I mentioned earlier on, Argentinosaurus, is a titanosaur. And we have found remains of a titanosaur, including a, a, a tailbone and this big upper arm bone I showed you earlier on probably also belongs to a titanosaur. So we know that there were titanosaurs in the Sahara. Um, one of them has been named. It's uh, actually more than just one, but one of the really big ones from the Sahara is called Parala Titan. And Parala Titan was um, uh, one of the largest dinosaurs. So 
titanosaurs can be found in the Sahara, and we found some titanosaur fossils. All right, another great question. Let's jump back online. I know there's some more questions. Um, let's see. In your mind, what's the coolest thing you've discovered so far? <laughs> mm, that's a tough one. Uh, because Spinosaurus, the, the big predatory dinosaur, is pretty amazing. And um, it's, it is one of the weirdest dinosaurs, if not the weirdest dinosaur. But then we also found these big flying reptiles, the pterosaurs, and they're absolutely amazing. And as I said earlier on, we, we have some new pterosaur fossils, and um, those are very interesting. Uh, can't tell you more about those now, but they're very interesting. Um, so the pterosaurs, spinosaurs, um, I don't know. We, we also found some really interesting croc remains of really strange crocodile-like predators. Uh, some of these crocs are running around on land like, like little dogs. You know, they're not really spending much time in the water. So there's so many weird creatures. It's difficult to pick one. I guess the coolest um, extinct animal for me is always the one that I'm just working on. And then when I work on the next kind of animal, I go like, oh, wow, this is the coolest. <laughs> All right. Well, this is from the same group. They have one more question. Yeah. <laughs> Who do you think would win in a fight, Spinosaur or T-Rex? Oh, I was waiting for that one. <laughs> um, I'm sure you get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the, the, the first thing I should say is that those animals lived on different continents, on different land masses. T-Rex in North America, Spinosaur is in Africa. But even if they lived in the same place, they were still separated by millions and millions of years. So they, did, they were not around at the same time. Um, they were both very large predators. Um, Spinosaurus had much stronger forelimbs with much bigger claws. Um, but then T-Rex had uh, more powerful jaws and a more massive skull. Spinosaurus was longer than T-Rex, but T-Rex was... Uh, maybe a little more heavily built in some parts of its body. So it's really difficult to compare them. They're quite, uh, they're, they're doing very different things. And as I said, Spinosaurus is all about catching these big fish, whereas T-Rex is, you know, hunting things like Triceratops or, you know, uh, maybe also every now and then uh, uh, feeding on, on dead animals. Um, so they're doing different things. If they did, um, face off, I guess it would be, you know, like tossing a coin. <laughs> um, if Spinosaurus gets the first good bite, I think Spinosaurus would win. If T-Rex gets a good bite, I think T-Rex would win because they have really destructive jaw power and big claws. So um, I guess it would be a draw. <laughs> so I know there's some debate about T-Rex and that possibly it could have been more of a scavenger. Has there been any more kind of thought on that? Any kind of consensus? Well, I think most people would say that T-Rex um, did a bit of everything. Um, I don't think that T-Rex was um, doing scavenging most of the time. Uh, I think T-Rex has these incredible powerful jaws, and yes, those are also useful to take apart a carcass, but really, um, you know, if you can crunch uh, bone with your jaws. It might be useful in a carcass, but it can also be pretty useful if you're catching prey. We have some fossil evidence where uh, dinosaurs were bitten by a T-Rex and, and that injury healed. So an animal survived a T-Rex attack. So that tells us that T-Rex was hunting dinosaurs sometimes. And the truth is, um, most animals, if you look at lions, they do some hunting, but if they find a dead animal somewhere, they'll go and take it. You know, if they find a a kill somewhere and of course you know the same thing is true for you know sharks you know you'll see great white sharks hunting uh, seals but you'll also see them feeding on a dead whale you know so uh, T-Rex was probably very similar doing a little bit of everything you have to be opportunistic if you're a big predator meat is meat <laughs> all right good point um, let's visit our New York classes one more time and see if they have a final question for you so let's let's jump to the group with Colin first the microphone's on. You guys have one more question. Yeah. 
How do you guess how? <laughs> My name is Joshua, and I'm in fourth grade. How do you, how do you guess how dinosaurs uh, sound? Mm. That's a very good question. Um, and the truth is, we don't really know. <laughs> we don't really know what dinosaurs sounded like. Um, we can look at their close relatives. So birds are obviously, you know, vocalizing a lot. Um, crocs are vocalizing a little bit. Um, alligators can be pretty loud. Um, but it is probably unlikely that T-Rex would be roaring just like a lion. But we don't really know. We don't really know what, um, uh, what dinosaurs sounded like, unfortunately. All right, and Chris's group in New York, go ahead if you guys have a final question. I'm Zenibia, and what's your favorite, what's your favorite dinosaur and why? <laughs> what's my favorite dinosaur? Uh, again, I think this is something that changes. Um, you know, if you're working on a dinosaur, like when I was working on Spinosaurus, and I'm still working on Spinosaurus, so it's probably um, my favorite dinosaur at the moment. But, you know, you find new fossils and you're working on a new bizarre dinosaur and that, that kind of becomes your, your favorite while, you know, because you're working on it and you're spending a lot of time finding out more about it. So it's difficult to find one particular dinosaur um, that I would say is my favorite. I mean, there's so many incredible dinosaurs out there. You know, we mentioned some of them today, things like Triceratops and T-Rex, um, Spinosaurus, Stegosaurus. They're all pretty amazing in different ways. Um, so I would, I would just say that, I guess, as a group, dinosaurs are my favorite group of extinct animals um, because they have all these incredible adaptations and, and um, it's wide range in body size, uh, but it's difficult to pick one particular dinosaur. So you mentioned still working on Spinosaur, and I know uh, the cover uh, of Nat Geo was, it was a couple years ago now, I think. And, um, you know, you built that, helped build that amazing model. So what, what are you still doing? What, what kind of work do you still do even uh, at this stage? Well, uh, one thing that, that I'm doing is I'm working on a very detailed description of the bones of Spinosaurus because uh, when we first published our scientific paper on Spinosaurus, it was published in Science, which is a journal, a uh, specialist journal, where you really don't get much um, uh, space in terms of you know, describing things in detail. You, know, you can't figure lots of images and so on. Um, so uh, we're working on that on a very detailed description so that other paleontologists can see images of all the different bones of Spinosaurus and, um, uh, and look at all the details of the anatomy. Another thing we're doing is we're trying to understand how Spinosaurus moved through the water and how it moved around on land. Because it's such a bizarre dinosaur, um, we don't really know. Um, you know, we know that it was it clearly had adaptations for moving around in the water a lot, but, you know, we're trying to find out you know, how much did it use its tail? Did it use it like a croc? You know, what about these paddling feet? So that's something we're trying to, to figure out, working on the biomechanics of Spinosaurus. Um, so there are different projects um, related to Spinosaurus and, of course, a, a number of other uh, more recent projects, including the flying reptiles. And you mentioned the Nat Geo cover. Um, stay tuned. There will be another interesting story this year in Nat Geo magazine. That's all I'm going to say. All right, very exciting, keeping us in suspense. <laughs> um, just speaking of the Nat Geo magazine, just recently, I think in the last issue, um, there was a, a new find, a beautifully preserved dinosaur, even some of the skin and, uh, and such from, I think it was in the oil sands. That's pretty rare, eh? That's kind of like a one in a million kind of find. Yeah, it's very rare. It's a, an armored dinosaur and it's a beautiful fossil. That's the thing. Sometimes you look at fossils, and the only word you can really find to describe them is beautiful. You know, when you see this thing, for example, it looks like the animal is just sleeping. You know, that's how well preserved it is. And you know, I, I get that sometimes with fossils, they 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 are interesting scientifically, but they are also objects of beauty. I think they're pretty amazing. And to think that these 
animals lived, you know, a very, very long time ago, millions of years ago. Um, and to then find them preserved like this is, is nothing short of incredible. You know, there's another famous fossil of a little dinosaur and it's sleeping. It's actually, you know, it's tucked its head under its wing and it's curled up. And that's how it was found, you know, curled up and sleeping. I mean, how cool is that? It's pretty amazing because most, you know, is, is bits and pieces, right? And and you're making yeah. predictions yeah. from from what you find. So these kind of big finds are pretty amazing. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I always tell my class as well that it's an honor to be fossilized. It's it's pretty uh, yeah. it's pretty rare. So it's pretty and amazing. And do they agree with you? <laughs> pretty amazing. You got the right place, right conditions. Pretty amazing. So you're gonna try and be fossilized. Well, I mean, it would be pretty impressive. <laughs> By example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully not for a long time, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I agree. It's pretty amazing. I mean, just, you know, if you look at some of the famous, really famous skeletons like Archaeopteryx or Lucy, um, you know, if you look at those, they, they become, you know, icons of, of evolution. They become really famous. And yeah, that would be cool being one of those fossils. <laughs> All right. Well, Nizar, as always, it's a pleasure to to catch up and to see your work, and and I love your passion for sharing this with students. So um, it's always a pleasure to host you. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to throw things over to Lindsay from the Nacho Education side. But um, yeah, I, I highly recommend the classrooms watching live or later words via, or later via YouTube to ch to dig a little deeper because the the story behind the discovery of the the spinosaur is a pretty awesome story. And it's a mystery tale, and it's, it's, it's pretty cool, some detective work. So definitely check that out. But for now, I'm going to throw things uh, back to Lindsay. OK, thanks, Joe. Um, and from all of us at Nat Geo, huge thanks to you, Nizar, for teaching us so much about your work and about dinosaurs. Um, I guess we'll all have to stay tuned for what's coming next, which sounds exciting. Um, and huge thanks to you, Joe, for, um, for hosting us today and to all of our classrooms for all of their great questions and participation. Uh, remember to check out natgeoed.org for more resources, and um, you can find more updates on Explore Classroom there as well. Okay, thanks, everyone. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. Uh, Nusar, if you can stick around for just a moment after we log yeah. off. Um, I want to thank our class from Ms. Amora's group from Texas. They had to duck out for their lunch hour. Uh, Mrs. Byer's group joining us in Virginia Beach and, of course, our groups in New York. In fact, I'm going to turn your microphones on and I'll let you guys have final say, let you guys say goodbye and thank you. So, Nazar, again, thank you so much. My pleasure. And, uh, here come the class. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. And uh, we're signing off for now. Thanks, everyone.